everyone and good afternoon. I would like to introduce to you Anisha and Durga. And they are going to present on their research on, um, with transcription factors within certain cell cancer or cancer cell lines. So welcome Anisha and Durga. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anisha, and our project is basically on the analysis of unknown transcription factors in ACP116 and MCF7 cancer cells. Um, so we're basically just going like, to give a few introductions about cancer and transcription factors, and then we'll be talking about our specific transcription factors. We focus on ZNF277, ZNF274, and ZDTV24. Um, we underwent various processes in the lab that <laughs> consist of cell culture, gateway cloning, transfection, Western blot, and immunofluorescence. Uh, we'll just be talking about the results from our Western blot and immunofluorescence, and then giving a brief discussion about what those results meant and future implications of our research. So just an overview on cancer. Cancer is basically when cells in your body divide uncontrollably. It has many negative effects on the body since um, these cells um, dividing can uh, cause tumors and eventually uh, damage vital organs in the body. Also, cancer cells are widely used in research because they do divide and grow rapidly. Also, there's little to no treatment on cancer cells, so this opens a new field for researchers to work towards increasing the survival rates for certain cancers. Um, the two main cancer cell lines that we decided to focus on in our research project is HCT116 and MCF7 cells. Um, as shown here on the left, this is HCT116. Um, this is found in colon cancer. It affects 5% of the population, and it mainly affects males, and also males around the age of 50. On the right, we have MCF7 cells. Uh, MCF7 cells are found in breast cancer and breast cancer affects 41% of the population. It mainly affects females of the age of 40 to 70. Also, these two cells are adhering cells, meaning that they stick to the bottom of the plate. Only death cells uh, arise to the top. So the central dogma of biology is such that DNA is used to make RNA and RNA is used to make protein. And our research focuses on the step from DNA to RNA. Uh, transcription factors are protein complexes that regulate this process. They, um, they bind to the DNA strand and allow RNA polymerase to go ahead and copy the DNA into an mRNA strand. So there's two types of transcription factors, activators and repressors. Activators attach to enhancer sites and they increase the rate of transcription. And uh, repressors attach to silencer sites and they decrease the rate of transcription. Um, and the Human Genome Project, as like, a couple of groups already said, it's been, it finished in 2003, and um, it's really useful to just research because it allows us to um, study new genes and proteins and look at their functions. And in our case, it lets us uh, study transcription factors and see their role in uh, cancer development. So we focus on three unknown transcription factors. They have little to no research on them. The three we focused on was ZNF277, ZNF274, and CBTV24. ZNF277 has 450 amino acids and is located on chromosome number 7. It is predicted to be found in the nucleus. Uh, CBTV24 has 653 amino acids and is located on chromosome number 19. It is also predicted to be found in the nucleus and also predicted to be a transcription repressor, meaning that it inhibits transcription. Our last transcription factor that we focused on was ZNF274. It has 697 amino acids and is located on chromosome number 6, and it's also predicted to be located in the nucleus. So cell culturing is one of the first things that we did in lab, and the purpose of this is to make sure that the cells are like living in healthy conditions, that the dead cells are like off the cell plate, and when necessary, we split the cells so they have space to grow. So of the three liquids, uh, PDX is one of them, and it basically just washes off the dead cells on, the, on top of the cell plate. And then trypsin uh, pulls the adherent cells off the bottom and gets rid of those. And trypsin kills the body cells also, so it's important to make sure that this step is only three to five minutes so it doesn't kill the live cells in the cell plate. And then DNA is cell media, so it just has all the nutrients that cells need to 
to punish themselves. And then once they add all these and take off the old media, uh, we incubate them overnight and work with 70% component in the split itself. A large part of our project was gateway cloning. Um, past researchers have put human genes into peach, red, and plasmids. Um, prior to our arrival, zv 24 and ZNF274 were already placed in plasmids. However, ZNF277 was not placed in a plasmid yet, so that is what we did. And in order to place these plasmids, um, these genes into the plasmid, um, reverse transcription followed by PCR, gel electrophoresis, and recombination had to be done. Here on the left, we have a diagram of our plasmid with um, a flag tag and also the gene of interest. So reverse transcription was one of the first things that we did, and as the name implies, it just is the process that takes RNA and turns into DNA. And the primer is the origin of, well, it's not the origin of application. It's where the reverse trans transcriptase goes in and starts copying RNA into DNA. Um, and then we did PCR, which is the polymerase chain reaction, and that amplifies DNA. And when you amplify DNA, you're just making more of that target DNA. And the ones that we amplified were the genes that encoded for the three transcription factors that we focused on. After PCR, we conducted gel electrophoresis um, to visualize our PCR products. Um, the gel electrophoresis we loaded wells. First, we had a ladder with known gene sizes, and then we had our gene samples. Um, after we loaded the wells, a charge was um, conducted through the wells. Um, we had 100 volts, and we ran it for 30 minutes. Um, the charge allows DNA to move and separate according to their size. Um, after about 30 minutes, we shined UV light on our gel, and um, a diagram was shown with bands, and it would correlate with the sizes next to the ladder. So we were able to compare and contrast the sizes of our gene samples. And recombination was the final thing that we did. So in the plasmid, we uh, took two sections of it and basically switched them and then we had the bacteria grow and this was just to make sure that the plasmids were working so if we had colonial growth that meant that the plasmids were working. After placing the genes into our plasmids we conducted transfection. The purpose of transfection was to force plasmids, force plasmids into cells so target proteins would be expressed. Um, in our case, we expressed and also overexpressed vv 2 v 24 ZNF-274, and ZNF-277 uh, proteins in MCF7 and ACT116 cells. Um, this is also more commonly known as ex exogenous expression. Um, this transfection is really important to um, Western blotting and immunotherapy, which we will talk about next. So Western blot is the process that we use to visualize proteins. Um, we use it as a verification that transfection works. So the first time we transfected cells, they died. So we, the second time, we just needed to make sure that the cells actually took up the plasmid and expressed the correct protein. So uh, Western blot has two parts to it, running the gel and transferring the proteins onto a membrane. Um, really, so that's the gel apparatus thing for the first part. And basically, it's similar to gel electrophoresis. You have a ladder, and you load uh, protein samples into wells, and you run a charge through it. And then once that's done, you press the gel against the membrane, put it into a different apparatus, and run a charge through that. And then you have proteins on this membrane, and you coat that membrane with antibodies. Um, we specifically use an anti-beta tubulin antibody, and that allowed us to visualize it later for data to be too human After uh, making sure that transfection was done correctly with Western blood, we did immunofluorescence. The purpose of immunofluorescence is to locate our proteins and to also visualize them under a microscope so we would directly know the location of our proteins. We used antibodies and these attached to the proteins and they would mark the protein with a specific stain and that stain would show up and uh, would tell us where the location of the protein was. Uh, we used three stains, DAPI, 488, and Psi 3. DAPI is a lens and it represented the DNA within the nucleus and it appeared to be blue underneath the microscope. Uh, then we used 488, which is also no, which is a laser, and it would uh, represent our target protein. So in our case, it would either be ZBTV or the other proteins that we're looking for, and it would show up to be green underneath the microscope. 
Uh, finally, we have Psi 3, which is also a laser, and it would represent the beta tubulin within the cell, and more commonly known as the cytoskeleton of the cell, and it appears to be red underneath the microscope. So this table just shows like all the antibodies that we coded on the protein. So the top was our negative control, so we didn't have any antibodies that we put in it because we weren't dating for any protein for the cytoskeleton. And then the rest of the antibodies are the same except for the primary antibody that's specific to the protein, um, since that's how the antibody will recognize the protein. So this is the Western blot image that we got. And the red box kind of outlines the bands that we were looking for. They're not really that clear, but it was enough to verify that two inspections did work to some extent. Uh, the column one on the side, that band is pretty good. And then the other bands um, were about relatively the same size. And we knew that all the samples needed to have bands because beta tubulin is found in the cytoskeleton, just coming to older cells. So here are the negative controls for immunofluorescence. Um, yeah, so there was no protein staining or beta tubulin staining, so we only had Daphne in this one. Here we have um, ZMF 274 and HCT and MCF7. Um, here um, we have the protein to be located outside the nucleus however, within the cell because of the lining. But in MCF7, we have the protein to be located inside the nucleus. And this was what we didn't expect. We expected um, all, the, all the proteins to be located inside the nucleus. We will talk about it more. Um, so this is a ZDTV24 protein. And as expected, the proteins were located in the nucleus. Um, so on the HCT number 6, there's a faint red stain. Uh, the beta tubulin stain did not work well in immunofluorescence. Most of our pictures didn't really have the red outline, but this picture kind of did. So that's kind of what we were going for for all of the cells. Here we have ZNF-277A. We also have a ZNF-277B. It's essentially encoding for the same protein, however, we just use different antibodies. Um, the purpose of doing that was to see which antibody would work better. However, in our case, neither of them worked that well. Um, over here, you can see that the whole cell is emitting green light, and that's not what's supposed to happen. We should have a clear distinction of where the protein is located. Um, this is due to autofluorescence, and we will talk about this later, but it is shown in both MCF7 and HCT116, and also in the, I can't really see where the protein is located. Then we have a positive control, which is coiling, and previous research has um, confirmed that coiling is located in the nucleus, so we were expecting to see a lot of like, protein stains inside, and that turned out pretty well. Okay, so ZNF274 and ATT, the proteins were located outside the nucleus. However, in, ZN, in MCF7, the protein was located inside the nucleus. So this could correlate to why um, the development of cancer for HCT116. Also for ZBTB24, it was found to be inside the nucleus for both. So we could verify that this is a transcription factor and it acts as a normal transcription factor. Um, ZNF277, as mentioned before, the whole cell was emitting green light and this is due to autofluorescing, which uh, means that live tissue has a tendency to emit green light. So instead of the protein emitting the green light, we saw live tissue emitting green light. Uh, so possible limitations to our data, like obviously I already said the autofluorescence of ZNF-277. And then we also had a lot of disrupted nuclei. That's a picture of one. And this damages the cells, and it's not good because then it's not going to produce the proper protein. So that didn't really allow to image a lot of the cells that we could have. And we also have a lot of bubbles and smudges, and that's because we kind of didn't clean it well before we mounted the cells onto the slide. So that kind of disrupted um, a lot of the imaging. And then with transfection, I previously mentioned that our cells died the first day, first time we transfected them. And that's because our CO2 incubator um, like broke 
the day after we transfected the cells. So that just shows that HPT116 is a pretty sensitive cancer line and uh, it needs a good environment, a stable environment to grow well. So for the future, um, ZNF and some of should be researched more to see what it has um, linked with cancer since it was different, was found to be in the nucleus in one and then outside the nucleus in the other. Also, ZNF 277, since we couldn't really locate the protein, different antibodies should be tested to actually locate where the protein is. Um, also, transcription factors as a whole should be researched more often because it does have a big role in cancer. Um, also, since we did, as mentioned before, HPT 116 was very sensitive to environmental changes. Um, if there is further research, um, HPT 116 should be kept in a stable environment. Um, so, yeah, now we have acknowledgments. So, we just want to thank Dr. Sutsbury for um, letting us use his lab and all his materials. And we want to thank Alexis and Zach for just mentoring us and guiding us through this research project. We would like to, we would like to thank Preston and Esme for um, working with us in lab. Uh, we would like to thank Nicole for assisting us in our research papers and giving us, giving us feedback on it. I would like to thank Excel Energy for uh, financially supporting our research project. And I would like to thank the Edward Madigan Foundation for Finally, we would like to thank Lori Ball for coordinating Frontiers of Science Institute and also UNC for allowing us to use your department.